All right, good morning. We are going to wrap up our Connect Four series today. Next week, uh, we're going to have the first installment of what's going to be kind of an intermittent series. We're going to have one installment next Sunday, then one in July, and then one later in the year. That's going to be kind of called How in the World? And so we're going to think about some global concerns and talk about how in the world Christians should be thinking about these things. And so I'm um, really excited to have uh, Alan Schoonover come and speak for us next week and share with us about that. So we're going to wrap this up today, and I have committed myself to not touch this. Um, if you were here last week, you know bad things can happen. And so um, we're just going to leave. It's just to look at today. Look and, and not touch, right? If you see me going for it, just be hey, don't, don't touch Just tell me, okay? So as we wrap this up, we've talked about these four fronts of ministry that uh, every healthy and productive church is engaged in. Uh, The first is our connection to God. Uh, The second is our connection to each other. Uh, The third, last week, was our connection to our community. And then today we're gonna talk about connecting to our culture. And I know sometimes we use community and culture in ways that overlap, so I'll clarify for you in a moment uh, the distinction between those two. But uh, I just want to start by acknowledging some common ground. I think we all acknowledge that there are things about our culture that could be better, right? If we, if we think of culture as the way that people do things, there are things that could be better. There's a lot of room for improvement in our culture, whether you're talking about American culture or Midwest culture or Hamilton County culture or Northern Hamilton County culture. Uh, you can zero that in as closely as you want, even to your family and our household culture. And you can say, there's room for improvement here. But Most of us, when we think about cultural change, we don't see ourselves as cultural influencers, so we we don't really think there's much we can do to change culture. We think that um, it takes uh, somebody with a lot of power and a big platform or a big audience to actually change culture. And what I hope to do this morning is uh, change your mind about that and um, clarify for you that you are invited by God to help change culture and to make it better, healthier, more God-honoring, a better reflection of what God created us to be, how he created us to live in this world. So to do that, we're going to talk a little bit about bread. I like bread. I like trying to make bread. I'm not very good at it. It's challenging. But here's some things that I've learned about bread. Um, It's very simple. The ingredients are very simple. If you have flour and water, you can make bread. I mean, it's that simple. If flour and water, you you can make bread. And uh, the question is, do you want it to be good bread? (laughs) Um, If you want it to be good bread, then you have to know some things. And so one of the things you need to know are the ratios of of the ingredients. And so uh, this is 1,000 grams of flour. I used 1,000 because it's an easy number to do ratios with because I'm not a math genius, okay? Um, some of you are like, we, we know, we, we, we're aware. 1,000 uh, grams of flour, and uh, the other ingredients are based on ratios to that 1,000 that grams. And so um, for uh, your hydration, you want somewhere between 78 to 80% hydration, depending on the kind of bread that you're making. So I went 75, this is 750 Uh, grams of water. And so that's 75% hydration for my 1,000 grams of flour. So if you want to make good bread, you can take, this is my recipe, you can take good notes. So if I made bread with just this, you would not like it, okay? It would would actually taste bad. It wouldn't taste neutral. It would taste bad. Some of you are nodding. You've done this. You've made this mistake. You forgot this third ingredient, which is salt. Some of you are like, no, it's yeast. Well, you can make good bread without yeast, but you can't make good bread without salt. And so your ratio for salt is 2%. 2% of your flour, that's your uh, salt ratio. And so this is 20 grams of salt that I would put in that much flour and I would end up with about this much bread. It's a lot of bread, isn't it? I don't, you could, it's pretty heavy. Here, fill it. So don't eat it, just hold it. Nicholas threw it to the wrong person. So um, you can make a lot of bread and you only need 20 grams of salt to make it taste good. And I think that um, this principle applies when we think about uh, shifting culture, is that it just doesn't take a lot 
of people who are living differently in order to bring some flavor and health and the character of God into our culture. What are you doing with my bread? Okay, it's safe. It's safe now. I think um, we're going to use these same ratios, even though I'm not sure they're biblical. They're just Adam's idea of ratios. If we wanted to shift the culture of Cicero, Indiana, there's about 5,000 people in our town. What's what's 2% of that that it would take to bring some flavor and and the reflection of God? It's 100 people, right? 100 people who are sold out to the way of Jesus, I think, can make a difference in a town of 5,000. Can you imagine what we can do? There's, there's, there are thousands of Christians in Northern Hamilton County. What kind of impact should we be able to make on the culture in which we live uh, for the kingdom of God and, and for the name of Jesus? So we're gonna talk about um, what that looks like. We're gonna start by understanding what the Apostle Paul says about how we uh, should be thinking about this. Because for a lot of people, it may, maybe your idea of of Christians impacting culture is like, we, we should just stay out of it. You know, we, we should do our thing and let culture do its thing because ultimately Jesus is gonna come back and fix all the things that are broken and, and, and we can't solve it all anyway. But I think Paul had a different mindset. And here's what Paul says in Colossians chapter four to these young Christians, these first generation Christians about how they should be thinking about the culture around them. Uh, if you see something on the screen that's underlined, Please read that aloud. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Ooh, seasoned with what? Salt. Hmm. Hmm. So that you may know how to answer everyone. So Paul says, when you're thinking about people who are not followers of Jesus, the culture around you, here's how I want you to think about it. I, I want you to be intentional. So if you're gonna be wise, if you're gonna make the most of every, every opportunity, then that requires some intention. You can't be passive and let culture happen to you. You have to be active and you happen to it, right? And so uh, he says, I want you, your conversations to be full of grace. Grace is undeserved merit and seasoned with salt. He said, I want, when you talk about the kingdom of God, do not commit the sin of letting it be boring. There, there are a lot of things we can say about the kingdom of God and the way of Jesus. It is challenging. It is countercultural. It, it is not for the faint of heart. But one thing it's not is boring. Following Jesus is not boring. And if we make it look boring or if we make it sound boring when we talk to people about the kingdom of God, we're, we're committing a sin, I think. Paul says, put some salt in there. You, you've got to show people how interesting, how engaging, how, how adventurous it is to live the way of Jesus. And that's what he wants uh, people to do. And so what does it look like for us to do that? Well, first I want to distinguish between culture and community, because again, I think we use these words interchangeably sometimes. Community is people. Community is the people around us, right? And those those are the names of your neighbors and the people that you work with. Culture is what those people do. It's uh, how Andy Crouch would say it is, is culture is what we make of the world. The, the world in which you live, specifically your context, what you make of that world, that's your, that's your culture. So it's what people do. So if, if I were to say, uh, just say, I want you to think about 80s culture, what comes to mind? Some of you are like, no idea. Um, but what comes to mind when I say 80s culture? Feel free to participate. Big hair. Big hair. What? Disco? I thought that was 70s. Okay, we, we, we've got certain kinds of music. We've got certain kinds of way people dressed. When my wife turned 30, we had an 80s birthday party for her because she is a, a child of the 80s. And I didn't have to tell people how to dress for this party. People just knew because that's a cultural thing that people did. And it was horrifying and fun all at the same time. And if I never see leg warmers again, it'll be too soon. So um, we, there, it's the way that people interact with the world around them, that's culture. So the Midwest has a culture, and this is something unique about, this is part of Midwest culture is that you don't think you have a culture. I say you, I mean us. I'm, I'm here, I live here, I'm part of you now. But it's harder to see when you're in it than if you come into a culture from the outside. And so I'm, I, I grew up in the South, and when I moved to the Midwest, there's some things I noticed that you guys think are normal that are really just Midwest culture. Um, here's what you need to know. Chicken and noodles is not everywhere. 
You're like, what? No, it's not everywhere. It's Midwest culture. Who, who's, who's not from around here that agrees with me? You're like, yeah, this is, it's a kind of a weird thing. Uh, pork tenderloins, the size of your face, that's not, that's not normal. Like that's, that's Midwest culture, okay? That's the way that people do things here. And the way that you talk, you think that you're like the only people in America who don't have an accent. It's just not true. It's just not true, okay? So when you're in it, you don't see it, but when you come into it from the outside, you see it. And what we're talking about is what, as Christians, if we're gonna think about culture, if we're gonna be wise and make the most of our opportunities, we have to get to know it, but getting to know it is not the same thing as changing it. We not only have to get to know it, but we have to affect some change. So how do we do that? How do we affect change? Well, the primary way I want us to think about affecting change in our culture is by integrating faith and work. Integrating faith and work. Uh, and so uh, faith is, is the, the center of our lives as Christians, Jesus-centered living, and work is whatever it is that you do primarily. It may be what you do for a paycheck, but it may also just be the way you spend the majority of your time, whether that's raising children or volunteering or you, you know, playing golf or whatever it is, that's, those, those are your work opportunities. And so um, I'm really excited to have Hunter Razzo come up and share with us about integrating faith and work. Hunter and Miranda are um, missionaries in Berlin, Germany, along with their children. That's Rudy. Hi, Rudy. He's And Olaya, she's probably in the kids' area. And so this is something that, that is very central to the way that uh, Hunter and Miranda go about their, their ministry and their life in Berlin, so I wanted him to come and share. When I say faith and work um, and integrating that for the sake of culture, what does that mean to you as, you're, as your son leaves yes, the room? He's, he's uh, definitely a daddy's boy right now. <laughs> yeah, I think um, faith and work is interesting. We obviously are missionaries in Germany. We've also been, I've been blessed to work in landscaping for the past uh, five years in that context. Um, if you go to the lunch afterwards, we're explaining a little bit of a transition more into the art world, but what I've seen uh, doing landscaping in Berlin is that there's quite a big difference between those that will work with integrity, do things honestly, and really men that are filled with the Holy Spirit. In Berlin, there's 0.01% of Christians, and so um, that would be as though, how many of you have been to Lucas Oil? There's pro I think it's probably something like, does anybody have any idea of how many people in there? It's somewhere around 60 to 70,000 maybe. That would be as though the entire stadium's full and there's maybe like a row of people. That's about the, the ratio to Christians. And as Adam knows, the people in Berlin's, their uh, greatest desire is not to be kind or warm. And so those that are filled with the Holy Spirit and have the fruits of the Spirit, those that operate in joy in life, it's quite a bit different. And so for my context, to operate in joy, to operate in self-control and kindness, uh, we've seen a radical difference. Uh, one main example is that one of the husbands came to us after we had finished a job and he just said, hey, I haven't ever had construction workers that I felt I could leave my wife home alone with them. I haven't ever felt safe to just have men uh, of your guys' trade that I felt really totally safe and trusted them. We've had opportunities that we get to pray with people, but I think the main thing is it's not always about what you're saying. Sometimes it's really just the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life and how you're operating that's quite a bit different in the workplace. Yeah, so um, I know that uh, Miranda does some things through art as well, photography and art, and you guys um, are very intentional about building relationships through your work. And so talk a little bit about that. What does relationship building look like and uh, how is that connected with your, your desire for what you want to see for your community? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we really felt pretty clear from God that our art and our abilities were really to be used to leverage the kingdom of God. And so last year, Miranda felt to do free photo shoots for a number of families in the city. I believe it ended up being somewhere between 40 and 50 and the relationships we built by what we would offer was really drastic. Um, there's even, um, I always forget how to say this, a Portuguese sous chef who's an atheist. Her family doesn't follow God, don't believe that God could ever be real. But it says really clearly in the Bible that they'll know us by our love. And so it's been amazing to see us interacting with this lady who we have no business knowing, 
but we're given an opportunity by what we offer and seeing this lady actually transformed by the power of our love. She still doesn't believe that there's a God, but she knows that there's people that love God and can love well. And so we've really had more opportunities like this with what we have in our skill set to offer people. And I think really um, the Holy Spirit will give us a really amazing ability to use what we're talented, gifted at in order to reach people that we honestly are not going to ever sit in these pews. And I think everybody in the room has opportunity for that. Okay, so you said everybody in this room has opportunity. So we, it's easy for us to go, well, he's a missionary and we're not. So he's, he's got to think about this differently. Um, what can you tell us about what we need to know when it comes to thinking of ourselves as missionaries in our own culture? Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I was raised in this culture, so you you don't you don't get a free you don't get a jail free card here. I I understand very clearly what it looks like to be in Midwest culture. I came to Indiana when I was one. I stayed here until I was twenty two. So I understand this culture. I know what it's like to be kind. That everybody on the surface is great. I know in the Midwest what it's like to have these surface level conversations. But I think we all know what it's like to actually care for your neighbor. We know what it looks like to see that person who's hurting. We know what it's like to spend a little extra time, invite somebody over for a meal. And I believe the Holy Spirit's faithful. I think he's going to be faithful to highlight those people in your life that are hurting, that need a hug, that actually need you to not just say the surface level five minute conversation, but actually go deep, actually care about what they need, actually care about where they're at. There's people in every one of your lives that definitely needs just an encouragement. You wouldn't believe the impact that you can have tomorrow if you just stopped complaining at work and started saying, hey, Judy, you did a great job filing those papers. (laughs) Something simple by just encouraging your neighbor, shifting the culture of criticism and complaining, it's gonna change your culture and people will see a difference. That's just a little bit of salt in everybody's context and everybody can do it. I know that gifts, just operating in the Holy Spirit is gonna radically change your culture of your context, whether it be school, whether it be groups, whether it be work. And I really believe we all have the ability to do that. It's not a big thing. Awesome. So how can people stay in touch with you and and, uh, your family and your ministry and pray for you? Absolutely. Um, Back at the back, there are these little cards with our family's picture on them. They're just little postcards. You guys can hang those on your fridge and pray for us. Um, on the back, our website is on there, therazos.com, and there's also a QR code on there to um, just help support what we're doing. Um, we also are free to hang out after church. There's a lunch after church. We'll be around for a while, and then these cards are everywhere. So if you don't get one and you want one, just holler at me, and the best way to connect will probably be over email or in person. Great. Let's give Hunter a hand to thank him for I love what they're doing, and I, I love their, their heart and their approach to their community and their culture, and I think it's a good reflection of what we're created for. I don't know if you caught how uh, often Hunter referenced the Holy Spirit and talking about uh, listening to the Holy Spirit, being guided by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what they do, and uh, I think that's, that's critical and key, and the Holy Spirit really is, is uh, God in us to remind and, and show us the way that God has created us to, to interact in the world. And so let's go back to Genesis and let's take a look at how God has created us to interact in the world. Uh, we're going to be in Genesis 1, 26 through 30, so uh, lots of parts for you, so buckle up. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said... And every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. 
and to all the beasts of the earth, all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. And it was so. Are you, are you catching God's invitation to be culture makers here? So God has provided the raw materials and he gave us, you know, let's just go to the food. He gave us food to eat. Aren't we grateful? Aren't we glad we love food, right? But God didn't create salad trees, right? God created tomatoes and cucumbers and lettuce. And then humans took those raw ingredients and made salad. That's culture making. That's taking the raw materials that God has provided and putting something together that brings something good into the world. Although all, not all culture making brings something good into the world. Um, when we make salad, it's marginally good. Uh, better than, you know, I really like to get to the part where we can start eating chicken. But um, God's idea is for us to take these raw materials and bring something good out of it. So let's, uh, let's see another line here, uh, Genesis 2.16. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Again, this is an invitation to participate. Did God need humans? If, if God doesn't create humans, is the garden just gonna dry up and wither and die? Because God can't keep it going. No, God can keep it going if he wants to. But he gives humans this invitation to participate with him and bringing good out of creation. And then we get, um, in chapter four, we start to get into... Uh, some more specifics of humans uh, making culture. Um, this is chapter four, verse 20 through 22. Um, Ada gave birth to Jabel. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. And Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools and bronze and out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. So again, this is another example. Some of you are like, I have never heard those verses in my life. Yeah, it's in there, Genesis chapter four. But this is humans making culture. They're taking these raw materials and they're creating you know, farming and musical instruments and um, bronze and iron tools. And they're doing exactly what God created them to do. And so when when we get to where we are and, and, and we think like, well, all the tools have been created and all the instruments have been invented, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to continue to take the raw materials of the world that God has created and bring something good. Not everything that human cre humans create out of the raw materials of the world is good. You can take some you know, materials and, and create instruments for medical use and take the same materials and create weapons. Right, And so not everything that we create is, is for the flourishing of humankind. And so as followers of Jesus, our job is to be wise in the way we act, to make the most of every opportunity so that what we're contributing to the world is, is good culture. Not everything that humans make is culture because in order for it to be culture, it has to last. So you, you could create something. If it doesn't last, it's not really changing culture. Like, you know, laser disc is not culture. Right? Laser disc. Some of you are like, what's laser disc? Well, that's, that's why it's not culture. You don't even know what it is. It, it tried and it just didn't make it, right? So when we create something good that lasts, we are reflecting this thing that God put in us from the very beginning. And that's why Hunter keeps saying, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. It, it, it moves us to do the things that we're created to do. That's God at work in us. Um, Peter says it this way when he's talking to these um, early believers uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. These are people who are living in the hometowns they grew up in, and Peter's calling them foreigners because he wants them to have a missionary mindset about the world they live in. So, as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul... So Peter is saying, you've got to be discerning. You can't just passively move through life and think that culture is not gonna affect you. You've gotta be intentional and thoughtful. And so you, you're discerning, what are the things that dishonor God? And those are the things I'm gonna abstain from. And what are the things that honor God? Those are the things I'm gonna pursue. And when I live that way, people will notice. Like, like Hunter was saying, people notice the way that his construction crew operates because they're so different from every other crew. 
And when people notice that, it opens doors for the gospel, for people to say, well, here's, here's why we try to do it this way. It's because we believe that God created us for partnership with him and relationship with humans. And, and so this is our goal, is to be thoughtful, intentional about how we move through culture. So I wanna give just a few uh, tips really quick on how we can do that um, and the different ways that we can do that and then invite you to do this with your particular work. So let's, let's talk about ways to engage culture. Uh, the first uh, way is to condemn and uh, condemn is obviously a very negative sounding thing. And so uh, we, we think, well, maybe we shouldn't condemn anything, um, but uh, we shouldn't condemn everything. But when something is, is created or brought into the, the culture that is um, contrary to the way of, of Jesus, then it's, I think it's good and right for us to call that out and, and condemn that. And so when we think of things like racism and uh, the genocide that's taken place in different parts, we, we can, it's easy to, to step back and go, that's, that's contrary to the way of Jesus. We're gonna, we're gonna call that out, we're gonna condemn that. Or something like pornography is this cultural artifact that humans have created and brought into the world. And we go, that's, that's contrary to the way that God created us to think about sexuality. And so we're gonna condemn that. We're gonna stand against that. So that's, sometimes that's the posture that, that we take is, is condemn. The second way is to critique. And this is to just evaluate and, and find the good and, and leave behind the bad. And so this, this is our approach to um, a lot of art and, and entertainment, music and movies. And we try to evaluate what we're seeing or what we're hearing. And we go, well, here's, there, there's some good here. And, and then there's some things that we don't want to be a part of the way that we think about life. And if you're a parent or grandparent, I encourage you to teach your children to do this with uh, especially, you know, things they watch on, on the internet or, or, or television or movies is to be critics of it. Not critics in the way that they think everything is bad, but critics in the way that they're able to evaluate it, see what's good and hold on to it and then leave the rest behind. Right, that's what we want to, uh, to be able to do and teach our kids to do. Uh, the third uh, way is to copy. Um, there may be some things in culture that we recognize that even though this is not like a distinctly Christian thing, it's still true and all truth is God's truth. And so when we see this, even if it's outside the church, we go, hey, that, that, that may not have originated in the church, but that is, that is true and good and right and we should uh, listen to that. So one of the uh, things that sometimes there are pockets of people in our culture that do it better than the church is to learn how to disagree with love. So, so there, are, there are groups of people that are not Christians that do that better than some Christians. So when we see that in the world, we go, that's, that's God honoring and good and true is to disagree in love. Maybe we can learn from them even if they're not, even if they're not Jesus followers. Um, and then uh, the fourth is to consume this is something that we might do with culture. That's just to not really even critique it, evaluate it, to just take it in. And you're thinking, well, what in the world could we possibly consume? Well, to take it very literally, uh, food. So food is cultural, right? So we've, we've talked about chicken and noodles and, and pork tenderloin, but if you come to where I was raised and, and I serve you breakfast, there are gonna be grits there and, and you will consume those grits because it's part of my culture. You know, whether you, you like the idea of it or not. And when we encounter people from other cultures, one of the best things we can do to embrace their culture, try to learn from them, is to eat their food because food is very important and very cultural for people. And so that's, that's one example of something we might consume. And then the, the last piece is the things that we should always do, and that is to create and cultivate, that we should be people who are bringing something good into the world and cultivating the good that we see so that it um, upholds the dignity of all people and reflects the nature of Christ. When we are, are bringing things in or partnering with those who are bringing things into the world that uphold the dignity of all people and reflect the nature of Christ, we are, we are culture makers in the sense that we are shifting culture. We, all we have to be is 2%. If we're 2% of the people who are doing this, we can be a part of shifting culture in a way that really makes a difference. So here's the challenge. What I want to invite you to do is whatever your work is, we're going to integrate faith and work, whatever your work is. And again, this may be something that you get paid to do for a job, or it just may be the way that you spend the majority of your time. So if you, if you go to a job, if you're a teacher or a medical professional or whatever, then I want you to think in those terms. If you're, if you're raising your children or helping raise your grandchildren, or if you're um, a volunteer uh, somewhere, or you're involved in the senior center, or you go to the golf course, that's your work. I want you to think in those terms. 
So um, when it comes to your work, what practices in your field should be copied or consumed? Where can you say, I see God's truth here. I see um, something that's valuable and helpful, and, and I want to embrace that and partner with that. What practices in your field should be critiqued or condemned? Where you go, nope, we need to back off. We need to hold, be slow about this. We need to evaluate what's good and what's bad. Or we need to just say, this is contrary to the way of Jesus, and we don't want to be a part of that at all. And then uh, ask this question, how can we create and cultivate practices in our field of work that uphold the dignity of all people and reflect the character of Christ? So if, if you're an educator, then I would love for you to have some friends who are also educators who love Jesus and ask these questions together. What, how can we bring some things into our field that uphold the dignity of all people and reflect the character of Christ? That's you being your 2% bringing salt into your world, right? So I want to invite you to ask those questions and think through those things together because I think that... Um, when Jesus, he says a couple things uh, throughout the Gospels that uh, I think make this conversation really come home for me. One is he looks at his disciples and he says, you are the salt of the earth, right? And, and, and so without us, the, the bread that, that, that is made is, is just not gonna be good. I mean, it's not gonna be good. It's not gonna be what God intended. It's not gonna be full of peace and joy and purpose. And so our culture needs us. And the second is that Jesus says, I, I am the bread of life. Like, I, I'm the actual bread. And I don't think Jesus meant bread without salt. Bread without salt, you eat it and you don't want any more of it. I think Jesus meant bread that when you eat it, you want more. And may God help us be a community of people when that when people interact with us, they want more, not less. So this is our calling. This is our mission is to be salt so that when people interact with followers of Jesus in this community, they want, they want more of that, not, not less. So I wanna invite you to pray about this with me. We're just gonna um, ask God to um, turn our hearts uh, and ask the Holy Spirit to, to be very um, vocal in our hearts about the ways that we can be a part of shifting culture. And maybe you have to start with the question of, can I make a difference? And what I hope the Holy Spirit will communicate directly to you is that absolutely you can. That's why you're here, is to make a difference. And so whether you're young or old or you know, in between, um, you can make a difference. And so let's start with that and then ask the Holy Spirit, how can you be a part of bringing something good? Or how can you be more uh, maybe intentional and aware of what you need to criticize or condemn or um, or consume. So let's think about it in those terms as we pray. Father, we're so grateful for the way that you have um, invited us to do this work with you of bringing good out of the world that you have made. And my prayer is, Father, that, that as we do that, we'll, we'll grow in our ability to discern um, what's best and that we'll listen to your spirit as you guide us into those opportunities. And ultimately, God, that, um, that your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're excited to close our service today uh, by celebrating the baptism uh, of Jenna and Dylan. And so I'm gonna get out of the way and we're gonna celebrate that together.